نہ تیرا خدا کوئی اور ہے نہ میرا خدا کوئی اور ہے نہ تیرا خدا کوئی اور ہے نہ میرا خدا کوئی اور ہے یہ جو راستے ہیں جدا جدا یہ معاملہ کوئی اور ہے اور زبیر نشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد رب العالمین و صلاۃ وسلم خاتم النبین و بعد السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ویلکم ٹو دا نیکسٹ ایپیسوڈ آف بلڈنگ برجز بٹوین دا فیٹس اینڈ بٹوین پیپل دس از مائی صاحب رفیق حسین ود آئی ٹی وی وی برنگ یو دس پروگرام وے وی کیپ ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ ون این ادر اینڈ انٹریکٹ ود ون این ادر اینڈ بلڈ دا برجز آف انڈرسٹینڈنگ between people and people of other faiths. We are continuing uh, with a very interesting series, a very uh, appropriate series on gender equality and women's rights. And uh, this is, you know, center page in, uh, in the world right now. And uh, we got no problem in terms of, uh, you know, the fact that we have these uh, women's rights movements. We will talk uh, about it and put it into perspective, given the fact that for the last 150 years, you know, in the, in the modern world, they've been, uh, uh, you know, subjugated or not given their rights. But we find that in terms of uh, Judeo-Christian text, we find that uh, the, there has been, according to what we did last week, if we recall, you know, that a woman is evil and, uh, and from her you put the D before it, she's the devil, which is not uh, the correct position, which is not, in fact, what Islam says as well. And uh, in this series, you know, uh, last week, Uh, if we just uh, recap, if we go to our screen, uh, we did a woman's timeline and we spoke about in the women's rights movement, we started in 1826 in the States. This timeline talks about the women's rights movements in the UK, you know, ending up in 1952 only with the, getting the right to vote. And then we're going to be covering these 10 topics. There's much more issues. And we, as I said, we paid uh, compliments to, and we thank Brother Sharif Muhammad. Uh, Kingston for having, uh, we used his article and Eve's fault, which we did, Eve's legacy, which we did, shameful daughters, which we did. We're going to talk about female education today, adultery, uh, you know, the right of women to give witness, female inheritance, plight of widows, polygamy, and the female Muslim dress code. Now, let's see how far we go. And we thank you again for the comments that we've been getting. And remember, we just to recap and to remind ourselves that we are doing this all from and uh, from the textual point of view. We're looking at all of these things from what the, the Quran is saying and what the Bible is saying and what Jewish uh, texts are saying concerning the issue of uh, the women. Now let's go to the education. Let's get to our screen and let's get right into the uh, discussion uh, because we have so much of ground to cover. We find that uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, it, and this is what it says, As in all the congregation of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, this is in terms of the, 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 the text from the, in the New Testament. Look at what the Quran says. In, from the Islamic state, there is a surah. Chapter 58 of the Quran. Now, this chapter 58, you know, there are 114 chapters of Surah. And I'm reading the text. Allah has heard and accepted the statement of the woman who pleads with you, O Prophet, concerning her husband and carries her or complaint to Allah. And Allah hears the arguments between both of you, for Allah hears and seals all things. Now, look at the difference between the, the first one, uh, you know, and it will, we'll quote later on, you know, other texts from the Judeo Christian traditions. You'll find that it is stated very clearly there that, uh, you know, the woman is not supposed to speak, leave alone. Uh, you know, if she cannot speak and ask questions in the church, in the public places, how she's going to learn. Uh, here uh, in chapter 58 on, 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 of the Quran, and we're just taking this one uh, uh, text, you know, there was a, a, a Sahabi, there was a companion, a lady companion at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and she was having some issues. 
and uh, she went to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, you know, complaining. Now, you know, p picture the environment. Do you remember we said in the last week's episode that even in the Arabian society, you know, unfortunately, the Arabs uh, inherited, so to say, this uh, gender bias and this uh, woman, you know, uh, uh, you know, dominating the women and she had no rights and she has no say. And, and then the Prophet, you know, coming now to change this whole scenario and say the woman has a right, has her own right. She has a right to, uh, you know, voice her opinion and what, what, what. Now, th this is revolutionary. You know, it's going to upset the apple cut. But here, what is unique? This is showing, again, the divine origin of the Quran. You find that God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse. This, look at this. A verse of the Quran, the archangel Gabriel. You know, whom uh, the Holy Spirit, the Archangel Gabriel, who the angel of revelation, brought this, revel this verse which you just saw on the screen and telling the Prophet, peace be upon him, yes, this woman, this companion of yours, this, uh, she has been coming to complain to you and God has heard a complaint and God is now giving you the answer how to deal with this thing. So you can find, you can see very clearly here that I Islam came with a very revolutionary message in terms of gender equality and equality at a time when women, as I said, you know, were really, really, uh, you know, looked down upon. Now, in terms of education, if we go back to our screen, I just, you know, because there's so much to say, I'm just going very briefly uh, so that we can cover much of the ground because we've got 10 topics to cover. We may, you know, get more. I don't know what, uh, we have some questions to answer as well. But if you get back to our slide, uh, just from the textual point of view, from the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, in terms of education, because this topic is on female education, the Prophet, peace be upon him, has said unequivocally that the seeking of knowledge is compulsory is compulsory on both males and females, right? It is compulsory. That the seeking of knowledge is compulsory on, uh, on males and females. And there's a nice incident here in the, in the time of the reign of the, the Khalif Umar, the third successor or the second successor to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, you know, after the Prophet, peace be upon him, Hazrat Abu Bakr was the first successor of the Prophet, peace be upon him. You find that... Uh, in his reign, now this is trying to show now we are looking at, I'm, I'm trying to put this issue of education uh, in a very uh, uh, factual way, right? And show you in, in real terms, show you by practical examples, how uh, from the woman being so oppressed in the time uh, of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and you know, in societies before that, uh, how he came uh, with the divine message, the final message to humanity, uh, you know, to bring back and give the woman her rightful position and status in society and her rights, which was denied to her up to then. You'll find that there was an incident in the time of uh, the second Caliph Umar, uh, you know, God be pleased with him, uh, and he was giving a talk uh, on the Friday, you know, as the Imam, as, and he was unique that he's not only the Imam, but he is, you call him the state president, he's the leader of the nation. And he found that people were uh, giving too much Mahar, you know, the dowry for the woman when you get married, it was getting out of hand. They, somehow they, they probably too much competition or, you know, everyone every want to be like the Joneses kind of thing. They were competing. It was getting out of hand. And, and he felt he needs to put it in because what about poor people? You know, they're going to feel, uh, you know, uh, small and left out and embarrassed and all that. Whatever maybe his all his reasons. He, on the Friday, you know, Friday is the day of Juma. On the Friday sermon, the, all the Muslim communities assemble. And he says, I want to put a limit on this matter. I want to put a limit. You're not going to go beyond a certain figure when you're giving your wife the dawah. Now look what happens. Now, before I tell you what happens, Sayyidina Umar, this leader, you know, every leader has his unique qualities. Hazrat Umar, you know, he was such a powerful ruler. The, you know, during his reign, the Byzantine Empire, the Persian Empire, all, you know, uh, uh, fell during his reign. He was very powerful. He was, uh, he was uh, you know, someone that people looked up to. And he was, uh, you know, he was feared uh, by his opponents because of his justice. He was a no-nonsense person. Let's put it that way. You know, he didn't take, even, you know, if it was his own family and his own son or his own, you know, he will stand up for what is right. And they knew that about him. So keep that in mind. This is his point. Very fast, uh, just man, fair man, but a very strong personality and very forceful personality. 
But having, when he said on the Juma, right, that I want to put a limit on how much money a man can give a woman when he's marrying her for a dawah. A, this Sahabi, a woman stands up in the masjid. The tradition tells us a lady companion or during their time stands up and with respect, Amir al-Mu'minin, leader of the believers, who gives you the right to put a limit on mahar when Allah and his Rasul did, did not put a limit on mahar? When, when God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran or the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his traditions and in his teachings, he did not put a limit. He didn't put a limit. How is it that you want to put a limit? So what did he do? Here is now the mark of a, of a, of a great person. He comes down from the member. He consults some of the other elders, companions, learned companions, uh, and he comes back onto the member. He says, the woman is right and Umar is wrong. I withdraw what I say. Now, this is remarkable. You know, imagine for him to come, he just issued, if you want to use the word, a fatwa. He just issued a verdict. And he says, uh, or I withdraw it, the woman is right and Umar is wrong. So this is, you know, how educated the women were on their rights. And they knew they were granted those rights. So stay tuned. We'll be back after the break to continue this instead interesting topic on gender equality. <laughs> Uh, welcome back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are continuing this uh, episode on uh, women's issues from a Judaic, Christian, and Islamic perspective from the text. Uh, we, we're speaking about education just before the break. Maybe just let me round it up from an Islamic perspective. Uh, let me let, tell you that, uh, and we know this, that, you know, these traditions, we talk about our books of ahadith and our traditions that we, of the Prophet, peace be upon him. You'll find that much of this we got from Aisha, and who was, uh, you know, one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his youngest wife. Now, the traditions tell us, and, and she was a great, great scholar. Even the daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Fatima Zahra, you know, who used to be consulted by the senior uh, companions, you know, on matters of all kinds of matters. In other words, if you have to use the term, they were consultants, they were like, uh, you know, the, the scholars, the alim, the muftiya, and they used to be con uh, consulted by the learned, the caliphs and the, the, the judges and people like that, because they were so uh, advanced in their learning in terms of education. So you see that verse of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not, not a statement uh, that was just made. It was practiced and it was, uh, you know, inculcated in, in the society that, uh, you know, can you just imagine what a revolution came about at a time when the girl babies were being buried alive. Imagine, that was the situation, that a woman, instead of having her right of inheritance, which will come to, was an article of inheritance. And, uh, you know, which the, 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 the book of Corinthians tells us, in terms of the Judaic Christian tradition, the woman, you know, can't open, uh, 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 can't op uh, voice, can't, her voice mustn't be heard in the church. She can't ask anything in the church. She has to go and ask her husband at home. Uh, all, from all that background, here comes the, the, the Quran, here comes the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he brings about this, you know, complete uh, rights and changes the whole, bringing about these changes. And these things are, you know, centuries uh, steeped uh, practices. Uh, if you want to use another word, conditioning. You know, people were brought up with this kind of way of life. And it was not easy. And that is now some of the reasons now you maybe those who have been following our, our programs from the beginning. Now maybe you can see some of the why he was, the Prophet was getting some of the opposition he was getting from his people. Because in a sense, he was upsetting the apple cart. But, you know, they didn't know that this is not his doing. That uh, this is the divine hand at work. And you remember just to, just to bring it back. Uh, because it's a uh, the comparative. This is a comparative study. You remember Jesus, peace be upon him, did say in a book of John that he has many things to say, you know, to to the Israelites. But uh, you know, he has to go, uh, because if he does not go, the the one who's going to come to teach him everything, he's not going to come. So, you know, the, and Jesus, peace be upon him, obviously because of what was happening and the plot by the, is, some of the Israelites and the Romans at the time to, uh, to get rid of him and the attempted crucifixion and all that, you know, his mission was uh, he didn't even marry. 
So he, he, you know, he couldn't complete his mission. He couldn't complete all he wanted to say about married life and show it by example and the issue because his, his uh, life, his mission was uh, very abruptly terminated by this plot to assassinate him. But that is why he did say that the one that is coming, you know, he, he will guide you on to all truth. He shall not speak from himself, but whatever shall he hear, shall he speak, and he shall glorify me. And this is in the book of John. And that he, the Muslims say, is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who came with this, uh, the, the, the final mission in all aspects of human life to come and, you know, uh, remold and, and throw out the wrong issues and things that are detrimental to society and bring in those values and laws and norms that will lead to a healthy development of individual society, uh, you know, country and the world. So I think let's go on with our, uh, with our next session. We spoke about education. Uh, let's go to adultery. If you go to our slide now, you know the issue of adultery again. Now we're gonna we're looking at it from the three different traditions: the Judeo Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition. In the book of Leviticus, chapter twenty, verse ten, you'll see on your screen, it is stated that, that the Bible decrees the death sentence for both the adulterer and the adulteress, and it's by stoning. Also, in other places, you'll see that. So, in the Bible, in the in the Judeo tradition, in the Christian tradition, it was stoning to death for the death penalty. In the Quran, chapter twenty-four, verse two. It is stated here that the woman and man guilty of adultery or fornication flog each one of them with a hundred stripes and let not compassion move you in their case in a matter prescribed by Allah if you believe in Allah in the last day and let a party of the believers witness their punishment. Now here you find that Islam did away with the death penalty for, you know, for adultery. Uh, and, and it is not there, whereas it was in the Mosaic law and, you know, in the Judaic traditions, it was the stoning to death for adultery. So you can see that, uh, again, here comes that, that issue, you know, if uh, the claim is that the, that the prophet, peace be upon him, was, you know, just copying things from the Old Testament and New Testament, then these are all like, so many examples we're giving. How come this is differing from that? How come, there, you know, there is no death penalty? Uh, you know, in, in the Quran, it's, uh, it's 100 lashes for the adulterer and adulteress. So one can see definitely what Jesus, peace be upon him, said, the one that is coming, you know, he's going to bring in the final, uh, you know, revelation. He's going to guide you unto all truth. He shall guide you unto all truth. Because I haven't finished what I had to say. So, and you know, these are the important issues. If you go back, uh, not only is the actual issue of adultery, you know, but let's, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the adulterer and adulteress, let's go back to the text and we find that there is more discrimination uh, in, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, 10, Deuteronomy 22, 22, Proverbs 6, 2, and chapter 7, verse 27. The extramarital affair of a married man isn't per se a crime in the Bible. It's only the woman who's, who's ostracized. To the present day in Israel, if a married man indulges in an extramarital affair with a woman, his children but by that woman are considered legitimate. But if a married woman has an affair with another man, her children by that man are not only illegitimate, but they are forbidden to marry any other Jew except converts or other illegitimate children, you know, uh, uh, somebody else who is illegitimate. Now you can see, you know, this is how this whole issue of now adultery and how the woman is being singled out again, you know, and given more punishment as if, you know, the, she's the guilty one. Yes, it takes two to do the wrong, right? So one finds that, uh, you know, again, we're using these examples, you know, I hope to, to clarify how from the, the, the Judaic Christian position is and what the Islamic position is when it comes to gender issues. Let's go to about now, you know, this issue of being, bearing witness means to be a witness. Now, these are legal issues. Remember when we started last week, this episode, we spoke about the timeline of the human rights, uh, you know, the human rights groups were in America and in, 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 the, in the UK. You know, only in 1952, the young women were allowed to vote in the UK. And only around about the, you know, 1920s, they were given the right legal status. Now, to give evidence and to be a witness was not allowed. Let's go, let us go to the, to the, to the, uh, to the Bible there. Right? In the Bible, you look there, the women in today's Israel are not allowed to give evidence in rabbinical courts because the Talmud says women are temper, 
temperamentally light-headed. And the rabbis also justify why women can't be evidenced and witnessed by citing Genesis chapter 18, verse 9 to 16, where it is stated that Sarah, peace be upon her, Abraham, peace be upon his wife, had light. In, book, in the book of Numbers, chapter 5, verse 11 to 31, if a man accuses his wife of inchastity, her testimony will not be considered at all, according to the Bible. The accused wife has to be subjected to a trial by ordeal. And, but as opposed to that, let's get to the Quran. This is what's going on in the Judaic Christian books, texts. As far as the Quran is concerned, in chapter uh, 24, verses 6 to 11 of the Quran, what does it say? If a man accuses his wife of unchastity or adultery, he is required by the Quran to solemnly swear five times, as, because he's got no evidence, as, as evidence of his wife's guilt. And if the wife denies and similarly swears five times, she isn't considered guilty, and in either case, the marriage is dissolved. Now, look at the, the stark difference in how the Quran is handling this issue and how the, the Judaic Christian text before uh, is handling the issue. The woman, uh, in terms of the Judaic Christian text, especially, you know, they, she's not allowed uh, to, to say anything, and she can't, you know, resolve it there. She has to go to a trial. Now, can you imagine? that a, a, a lady, firstly, uh, you know, the trauma of being in a court. She's, remember the earlier verses, she's not allowed to, her voice is not to be heard in the church, but now her voice is going to be heard in the court. She's already conditioned not to, to be shy and uh, apprehensive to speak in front of people. You know, now she's got to protect her, her innocence and her rights. And, the, you know, it's a male-dominated society and all this. You can imagine the trauma this goes. And, uh, and you know, th this is how, that, what she's put through in Islam. It's, uh, it, if the woman denies it, I didn't do it, the Quran allows, because in Islam, by the way, let me just as, a, as an aside, perhaps you know, for the benefit of uh, some of the viewers who are not of the Muslim faith, if a man wants to accuse his wife of uh, having an affair of adultery, then according to the Islamic requirement, he has to produce four eyewitnesses. Four eyewitnesses. Now you can tell me if, if any man can bring four eyewitnesses to somebody making adultery, well, that person needs to be punished because they're doing it in a place where four people see them. Normally, this is not the case. So stay tuned. We'll be back after the break to continue. <laughs> Welcome back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, we just said before we went for the break, we we're talking about witness, you know, women uh, having the right to be a witness uh, for, you know, in the civil matter and in protecting their rights, whatever it may be, not, not only in the adultery, but, you know, in any aspects of their rights. Uh, Islam allows the woman to that right. Uh, let's uh, proceed. As I said, we have a, a lot of ground to cover. What about inheritance? Now, remember, we did say, uh, and I think we, we need, this is a very important aspect of uh, a clear distinction uh, that how Islam being a divinely inspired uh, Quran that came about and brought some race, radical revolutionary changes in, in, in the rights of women in her right of inheritance. Because uh, prior to that, you know, in the, as I told you, in the time of the uh, Arabian society, prior to the advent of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the woman had no rights of inheritance. She, she was just, you know, taken over by the husband's brother or she was, you know, a commodity to be inherited. But Islam came and gave her the right of inheritance. Let's go to the slide. And this is very revolutionary and it's prescribed, uh, by the way, they are prescribed uh, percentages. The nice, another thing, uh, maybe we'll talk about it later. Let's go to the text and see what does the Judaic Christian text and Quran say, and then we maybe we can, uh, in this question or later discussion times, we can go into it. In the book of Numbers, chapter 27, verses 1 to 11, according to this verse, uh, you know, widows and sisters don't inherit at all. Widows and sisters do not inherit at all. Daughters can inherit only if their deceased father had no sons. Otherwise, the sons receive the entire 
inheritance. Now, if you look at the Quran, chapter 4, remember we said chapter 4 is the Surah Anisa, it's called woman, verses 7, 11, 12, and 176. Uh, you know, among the pagan Arabs before in Islam, inheritance rights were confined exclusively also to the male relatives. The Quran abolished all these unjust customs and gave all the female relatives their just share of inheritance. Now, this is very revolutionary. This is very important. And, you know, uh, uh, one finds that in, uh, the, another interesting thing, just you know, as an aside, these are specialized topics. We have experts, what we call uh, uh, is Islamic scholars, who are experts in this whole issue of inheritance. Because the Quran, uh, the Quran has laid down uh, what percentage must go to the, uh, if save the husband dies, what percentage must go to the wife, what must, if there are sons to the sons, if there are daughters to the daughters, like that, you know, the mother and the, it's a, it, it, Islam takes into account everyone, uh, you know, who is related and close to the, uh, you know, to the uh, person who has passed on that the estate and it has worked out the percentage. This is not left for me and you to work out because God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, we don't know who is nearer to us or what. But he is doing it justly. He's not bringing sentiment. These are what we call legal rights or what we may call biological rights or what you may call family rights, right? And these are things that uh, uh, the Quran has prescribed. It was, it's not decided by you know, some jurist or some maulana or a scholar or a priest. No, these are divinely ordained rights of inheritance. Now you can see, again, another reason how the Prophet ﷺ, in terms of the education, in terms of the woman's right to, you know, uh, of inheritance and all these other issues that we are, uh, we are going through, we can see this was not allowed in, in, a, in the Arabian society. It was not allowed in the Judeo Christian societies also existing at the time according to their text. But here comes the Prophet Muhammad with the final revelation to mankind, right? And he comes uh, sent by God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring back everything to its rightful position, to bring back, you know, the laws that were abandoned. Remember, Jesus, peace be upon him, also one of the issues while we're discussing this whole thing in context, you know, one of his issues, he was a major issue he was having with the Israelites of his time was what? I mean, if we ask the question, what, why did they want to get rid of him? And he was their own man. He was their own kid and kin. He was their own, using the same term we now, he's their own family, he's their own uh, blood, grown up, brought up in the, he's the, he was an Israelite himself. Well, what was the issue? One of the main issues Jesus, peace be upon him, had with the Israelites is that they were circumventing the laws. You see, the law of Moses, you know, and inshallah, um, uh, one of the next episodes we will do after we finish this uh, uh, women and gender equality issues, we're going to talk about the commandments, you know, the Ten Commandments and how the Ten Commandments, which was given, uh, you know, uh, by Moses, peace be upon him, and it, it's part of the Judeo Christian text. Uh, these Ten Commandments are also in the Quran. We also have, you know, commandments. People uh, try and think that Islam has got very harsh laws. This is another false impression. You know, you're very uh, harsh and very, uh, uh, you know, gruesome. We just saw on adultery. Right now, even as you speak, in the, in the Bible, the, the, the punishment for adultery is, uh, is stoning to death, not in the Quran. So who has got lesser punishment? You'll find that, uh, in, in fact, not only that, when we did the uh, series for stealing. In fact, there are certain texts of the Bible which, which gives the, the, the capital punishment for stealing, but not so in Islam. You know, Islam, you can, if the, if the uh, thief repents and he shows remorse and prepared to make amends, you know, it can be forgiven. So here we are sh seeing that Jesus, peace be upon him, was having an issue because they were trying to circumvent these laws and commandments, bring new things and not wanting to observe the commandments that were there. So, uh, so that was, uh, you know, in terms of the inheritance. Uh, let's go to another very interesting aspect uh, because we have so much to discuss on, 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 on this issue of gender equality is the issue of widows. You know, widows, when a man dies, he leaves. Look at the book of Isaiah in chapter 54, verse 4. Widows were among the lowest classes in ancient Israel, and widowhood was considered a symbol of great degradation. According to Genesis chapter 38, a childless widow must marry her husband's brother, even if he's already married and without her permission. She doesn't, it's not an issue, it's not a matter of discussion. She's going to be taken over by her husband's brother. 
Now, as opposed to that, look at the Quran in chapter 2, verse 231, verse 232, and verse 234. There is no stigma attached with divorce or widowhood in the Quran. This, the Quran, those, those are the verses that talks about this. And you know, while we at it, let's 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 discuss this very quickly. You know, again, there's a this wrong and 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 malice accusations against the Prophet peace be upon him. You know, this cartoon story and all this that was going on. And we did a whole episode to tell you one of the reasons why they're doing this is because of the growth. No matter what they're doing, all the lies they're speaking and all the wrong information and misinformation they're giving about Islam and oppressing women and, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, Na'uzabillah, you know, a womanizer and Islam is terrorism and all these wrong lies they are speaking. With all those lies, Islam is still the fastest growing religion uh, in the world and in Europe in particular. Now, this issue of the, the accusation to the Prophet, peace be upon him, I'm asking you, the viewer, an independent, objective viewer. The Prophet, peace be upon him, his first wife, he is in the prime of his life at 25. He is 25 years old. He's from the Quraysh tribe. Remember, he was offered in his early days, he was offered, you know, many bribes by the Quraysh to stop his message. One of the bribes, besides the money and leader, they will offer him women. But he chose Khatija Radul An. Khatija was a businesswoman who was a widow. In fact, she had more than one husband before that who passed away. She was 40 years old, 15 years his senior. This was going to be his first wife. He, had, he could have refused because he didn't have to accept it. It was a marriage is acceptance, you know, a proposal or rejection of the proposal. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, first wife by choice is a widow who was 15 years his senior. And he was faithful to her, and she was the only wife till she passed away. Now I'm asking you, you know, where is there anyone has got the audacity to point a finger to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in terms of womanizer? When in the first place he goes and marries a widow, which I just showed you, widows were looked down upon and frowned upon on society. You know, they were like not acceptable. It was a, it was a taboo kind of a person she was. Here the Prophet, peace be upon him, marries a widow. By the way, while we're on the issue, you see, it's by example. The Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't just talk his talk. He walked his talk. There are many, there's a verse in the Quran, and Jesus, peace be upon him, said this in the Bible also. There is a verse in the Quran where the Prophet, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, asked the question to especially the religious scholars, you know, is it, uh, why is it that you say that which you do not practice? Why do you preach what you don't practice? You see? So, so here the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, was putting into practice. And from the uh, other wives that he had, this is historical facts. Uh, to round up this issue of, uh, you know, widows in Islam, uh, that uh, of all the wives the Prophet, peace be upon him, had, only the one wife, Aisha, Radul Anna, was uh, not a widow. All the other, even the subsequent wives, after Khadija, Radul Anna, passed away, Prophet Sallallahu married Sauda, Radul Anna, he married a woman who was about 60 or, uh, you know, 65, 70 years old. Was this any other motive? You know, or that people have filth in their minds. One has to look into the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he, he, made, he, married, he made slaves marry aristocrats. He made Bilal Habashi, the black Abyssinian, to marry an Arab woman. He was breaking down the racism. He was breaking down the class barriers and all the stigmas and bringing gender equality. Stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, we are on the last segment of building bridges between the faiths, and we are busy with the issue of gender equality. And, you know, we thank you again. This is the time where you send us your comments and your feedback. Uh, perhaps maybe for those who want to take our details again, you know, please let it be a two-way interactive process. You can take our details from the screen. <clears throat> That's all our details there. You can find, you can send us at our street address in 444 Longbury, Phoenix, or you can <clears throat> send us at our box number, 60386-Phoenix-4080, or email us, info at ifree.com. Uh, and you can send us an SMS or phone 0318292652. Now you must understand that this is, let this be a two-way, uh, and we thank all of you who have been sending us 
uh, you know, your questions and your, all your uh, comments. Uh, we have been having some really very good comments. One of the questions that was asked by us, and which will go to the screen, and I'll go straight into it, we, we just breaking the, the, the discussion to allow for some questions on the gender issue. We will continue, inshallah, uh, with one more episode. I can see it will take us to do the gender issue. The question was asked, do Africans read or speak or understand Arabic? Now, mm, you know, it may just be uh, that it's not out of sync, but it's very important, uh, this question, because especially we uh, in, in Africa and in the world, uh, I think we'll start off by answering, remember, uh, we did do this demographics and we did do, I think it was the last uh, episode or the two episodes ago when we spoke about that there are more uh, non-Arab speaking Muslims in the world than Arab speaking Muslims. Today, among the, you know, almost two billion Muslims, more majority of them are not Arabs, but they speak and read Arabic. You remember as Muslims from small, we learn we teach our children uh, Arabic and the Quran. You remember, we did show you a snippet once about from, from a very small age, we teach our children uh, Arabic terms, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, all that. And then by the time the four years and four months, they have to go and learn the Quran in Arabic. So let's go to our screen. If you go to our, our slide, and I want you to watch this uh, um, slide very carefully. We would like to thank our, one of our IFRI team members, Altaf, you know, is our IT uh, part-time IT man. The one in red is these countries. Look at it in Africa on the top. All those countries, look at the Horn of Africa, Somalia, and right on the top, well, that's the Middle Eastern countries. But also you look coming down into Nigeria, and if you look at West Africa there, these countries are, you know, uh, their first language is Arabic. And if you look at the, the circle, the, 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 the circular graph there, uh, in a da, you know in a disc there that uh, the the one in blue is 16 percent uh, you know uh, of the people of Africa uh, are, are Arabic speaking they speak Arabic as well and by the way you know that Arabic is a lingua franca in in business Arabic is uh, one of the top four spoken languages in the world I don't know if you are aware of that but uh, one of the top four languages in the world is Arabic, where you find that uh, uh, even in business, even in uh, communication, uh, Arabic is becoming a very important uh, issue. Now, you know, uh, there's another question that was asked, uh, and which I think we want to give some, uh, uh, perhaps to break the, the, the discussion. And with this question, what, maybe we are saying this, what Islam has done for women, all right? But uh, let us look at what uh, some, uh, non-Muslims had to say about women. I'm talking about scholars. Now we have got here, we, you know, we, we spoke about Annie Besant first. Annie Besant, by the way, was a British lady, uh, a, a, an intellectual, a writer, an activist, who was actually fighting the uh, woman, women's rights issues. You know, we showed you those graphs, those timelines. Uh, she appears, if you go and research those, she was one of those activists uh, you know, in, 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 in the UK, in Europe, fighting for women's rights. Let's go uh, uh, and to our slide and let's see what Annie Besant had to say about women's issues. And she said, uh, often, I often think that woman is more free in Islam than in Christianity. Woman is more protected by Islam than by the faith which preaches monogamy. In Al-Quran, the law about woman is juster and more liberal. Now, this is not an ordinary lady. George Bernard Shaw said, he advised the people of Europe to adopt the system of polygamy to save Europe from inundation of adultery. Now, George Bernard Shaw, again, not a not a just an ordinary uh, you know individual he was an iconoclast he was a thinker philosopher writer playwright uh, uh, you know of his time uh, so was any bisan now i mean these people are talking about uh, you know there there is very nice to accuse islam the the islamic system of polygamy or what have you but you know, uh, but look at the good it is doing because you know they uh, maybe this next quotation sums it up, and I think we must pay attention to this one. It's a, it's a quite a long quotation by Annie Bisan, you know, in her book that she wrote. But I think uh, let's let's read it 
and let's, di let's digest it because this is coming from a, a well-informed European Christian lady, uh, you know, uh, uh, who studied, uh, uh, you know, Islam, Christianity, and on all the religions, uh, and who was living in the West. There is pretended monogamy in the West. There is, I, I may repeat some of the things, there is pretended monogamy in the West, but there is real polo polo polygamy without responsibility. But in reality, there is polygamy without responsibility. The mistress is cast off when the man is weary of her and she sings gradually to be the woman of the street. For the first time, lover has no responsibility for her future and she is 100 times more worse off than a sheltered wife and the mother in the polygamous home, which Islam prescribes. When we see thousands of miserable women who crowd the streets of Western towns during the night, we must surely feel that it does not lie in Western mouths to reproach and to, to attack Islam for its polygamy. It is better for a woman. It is happier for a woman. It is more respectable for a woman to live in Islamic polygamy, united to one man only with a legitimate child in her arms and surrounded with respect, rather than to be seduced, to be cast out in the streets, perhaps with an illegitimate side, outside the pale of law, unsheltered and uncared for, to become a victim of any passerby, night after night, rendered incapable of motherhood, despised by all. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful article. You know, and if you read about Annie Bison, she was fighting for the rights of uh, children, girls, ch child girls who were being sold into prostitution and all these kinds of things, you know, trying to, to, to bring, you know, uh, save the dignity of, of uh, children and women and things like that. But I think, uh, you know, dear viewers, what we are saying is, you know, one has to remove the, the blinkers of bias. Uh, one has to remove the blinkers of prejudice, you know, and look at things as they are and as they ought to be. I want to add, while I'm on this, uh, this uh, while I'm, it's not, it won't be fair of me from what I'm saying, it's, and I'm not uh, denying for one moment that these prejudices are still living. Uh, I'm not talking about the, the Western or the, uh, the community, which is not one, within the Muslim community. Within the Muslim community, as we speak now, widows are uh, despised of and looked down upon. Polygamy is despised and looked down upon. Now, these are things that are still happening uh, because of social conditioning and cultural conditioning uh, in Muslim societies. And, and yet the Prophet, peace be upon him, came 1,400 years ago you know, and brought these changes. Now, as I said, you know, we have to strike a balance. You know, Islam is the religion uh, of the Mizan. Islam is the middle road. Islam uh, is the divine religion. And, you know, if you ever you have to describe uh, Islam, which the Quran describes, and I like this the best, you know, that if you want to give a description of Islam, Islam is the religion of the middle road. Islam is the religion of balance. al mizan al ummatul wasata the quran says that we are the ummah we are the community of the wasata we are supposed to be that community that walks the balanced and middle road and therefore we are against these extremists whichever side you go right or right of the line or left of the line extremism is not allowed in islam some people feel if i go more radical you know uh, in islam i'll be purer in islam and i'm practicing better islam or if I, other ones say i go more left and become more radical and jihadist or what 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 i'll be more closer to islam no there's an, you don't go from the main you do not go and do anything in extremes, right? Islam is the religion of the Ummat al -Wasa. So same with women's rights. We're not going to go to extremes. Some of the women's and feminist movements are going to extremes. Some of them are going to the extreme and saying they are equal to the men. Now we are talking these things because questions are coming. One of the questions came that in this gender, is the woman equal to men? Let me just remind you that what the Quran says. You know, and perhaps, you know, seeing that we're coming to an end. You know, remember when, when, when Mary's peace be upon her, Maryam alayhi salam's mother. When Maryam alayhi salam's mother, she was expecting, you know, a baby, and she made a vow that she'll dedicate this baby to Zachariah alayhi salam, the prophet Zacharias. You know, this is in the Bible and in the Quran. Uh, and uh, because she wanted, you know, she was a saintly woman, a, a godly woman, and she said she wanted to give, dedicate this child to, to Allah's work, to, to, the, to God's work, to, 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 for, the, for the service of the prophet Zachariah, peace be upon him. But when the baby was born, it was a girl who is Maryam alayhi salam, later on to be the mother of Jesus. It was Mary. 
you know, peace be upon her. Now, when she saw the girl, you know, again, you remember we're talking about the Judaic Christian stigma on women? Yeah, you're seeing it here again in another way. She got shocked. She said, no, it's a girl. Because now in her own mind, she knows the girls can't do the work. And Allah replied to her, even if it's a girl, give it to Zachariah. God knows the girl is not the same as the man. It's not equal to the man, but the girl can do the work of God as well. Till we meet again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Na tera khuda koi aur hai Na mera khuda koi aur hai Na tera khuda koi aur hai Na mera khuda koi aur hai Ye jo raaste hai juda juda Ye maamla कोई और है